Okay, thank you very much. My name is Samir Sheth. Um, it's a pleasure for me to tell you about our study, um, which is a NIH Brain Initiative funded uh, study in the UH3 category. Um, our title is, as you can see here, Deep Brain Stimulation for Depression Using Direct uh, directional current steering and individualized network targeting. Um, I want to just start off by acknowledging uh, my co-PIs, uh, Nader Paratian and Wayne Goodman, who are also going to uh, give presentations on this topic. Uh, and this slide just shows our group overall. Um, so we have uh, two clinical sites, um, uh, Baylor with myself uh, and Wayne Goodman um, as uh, co-PIs here, along with uh, collaborators uh, Sanjay Matthew and Kelly Bajenki, and then UCLA uh, with Co-PI Nader Pratian, uh, and then also uh, our investigators, uh, Randall Espinoza, Catherine Nahr, and Nanthia Suthana. Um, this is uh, heavily engineering involved, and so we have um, uh, a great team at, uh, at Brown University led by Dave Wharton, uh, and then our other collaborators, as well as our um, uh, industry partner, uh, Boston Scientific. Um, so just as a bit of historical context, I'll start by just describing the current state of affairs as of, you know, recently based on um, previous trials of DBS for depression over the past several years to provide a background for what motivated our study uh, and why we designed it the way that we did. So uh, DBS for depression has been around for, for some time. It was initially um, motivated in the ventral capsule ventral striatum target based on the work of DBS for OCD in this target. Uh, and this is the uh, ventral portion of the anterior limb of the internal capsule. That's the target, uh, which initially was a target for uh, capsulotomy procedures, lesion procedures that were developed <clears throat> really in the mid uh, part of the last century uh, and from then on. So DBS for OCD developed in this target, and then based on the improvement in mood seen in those patients, uh, DBS for depression was tried in this target as well. So. This is um, one of the important um, initial studies uh, that was multi-site uh, with 15 patients at uh, Cleveland Clinic, Brown, and MDH. In, um, in 15 patients, and this was done uh, as an open-label series targeting that ventral capsule, ventral striatum region uh, with uh, bilateral uh, DBS electrodes. And as you can see here, the responder rate was 40% to six months and a little over half at their longest follow-up. Uh, and response is defined as a 50% reduction in the symptom score, the Hamilton or the uh, Montgomery Asperg uh, scales. Uh, and e even some of these patients achieved remission, which was a, you know, a score of less than 10 on those scales, uh, 40% at the last follow-up. And, and of course, these are patients who uh, are refractory to conventional treatments, medications, behavioral therapy, uh, and even oftentimes uh, electroconvulsive therapy. So um, this response rate is quite remarkable. Um, Adverse events-wise, the most important thing to know was that there, there can be hypomania uh, induced by a stimulation of this target. Um, that initial um, study and, and ones like it led to uh, an industry-sponsored trial of DBS in this target called the RECLAIM trial. And um, this was a, a double-blind sham controlled trial where uh, patients were randomized to sham versus active stimulation uh, one month after uh, surgery. And unfortunately, this one did not have a very positive result at the interim analysis. So there were 208 patients planned uh, when 30 were um, uh, operated and had some follow-up. They broke the blind to look at the data, and the sham rate was 14%, uh, but the active rate was also uh, only 20%, which was a non-significant difference. And so the sponsor basically stopped this trial at that point um, because they were not optimistic about uh, its prospects for success. <clears throat> Excuse me. The... Other uh, important target to um, discuss uh, that's very relevant to this study is the subgenual cingulate. So this is uh, also known as area 25. This is um, the subgenual portion of the cingulate uh, gyrus and regions nearby. And this is really the work of the group uh, initially from Toronto and then also Emory, um, initially um, uh, Helen Mayberg, Andres Lozano at, at Toronto, and then uh, Dr. Mayberg continuing this at the uh, Emory group. Uh, and so there were some several initial trials, and then there were uh, a few um, subsequent trials. And, and the two that I've shown you here are just examples of the variability that can be seen in the open label studies uh, of this target. Um, this um, the first one, Holzheimer et al. Uh, 2012, is the Emory group, the 92 <clears throat> excuse me 92 percent response rate. Um, on the other hand, the Canadian multicenter um, trial uh, published the same year. 29% response rate, so quite a variability. Um, but there's enough optimism to where, again, another industry-supported trial uh, 
called the Broaden Trial was launched based on the preliminary results for this target. Uh, again, 201 patients planned, uh, and again, the blind was broken at 90 at a planned interim analysis to see whether there was much divergence between sham and active. The trial design was similar in terms of having uh, randomization to active versus sham uh, just a, a month after surgery. Uh, and again, a sham rate of about 17%, which is as expected, but again, an active of only uh, 20%. And so a futility analysis demonstrated a 17% chance of seeing divergence between those groups if the trial were continued. And so, again, based on these data, the sponsor decided to uh, stop the trial. Um, the open-label follow-up did demonstrate some improvement, as you can see there, uh, about 50% uh, response rate um, a year and a half to two years afterwards in the, in the open-label follow-up. Uh, but again, you know, this trial certainly did not meet its uh, endpoint and was stopped at that interim point. So this is kind of the uh, point at which we were really uh, deciding what to do next regarding DBS for depression. Uh, and so, um, you know, based on the promising preliminary data, but then the two large uh, sham-controlled uh, randomized trials that did not show um, uh, uh an active response being greater than sham, we were trying to decide what to do next. Uh, and so based on this, you know, we had questions about what the path would be going forward. And after a lot of consideration, um, we thought about the following ideas. Um, one is that, you know, there's really a uh, an importance that we put on deriving a network-based understanding of depression, certainly, uh, specifically, but also mental health disorders in general. Uh, the idea is that these mental health disorders or, or psychiatric disorders, like neurological disorders, for example, are disorders of a brain network and not just of a single spot in the brain. Um, in particular, uh, with major depressive disorder, the symptom-based classification that we use for this is fairly limiting. Um, there, are, there are nine criteria in the DSM, and a patient needs to uh, demonstrate five out of these nine criteria to be considered uh, as having major depressive disorder. So you can have two patients with only one overlapping criterion with the same diagnosis. And uh, anybody who's seen patients with this disorder, they can look very different. And so it's reasonable to conjecture that patients who are looking different, you know, typically symptomatically, um, that this difference is because perhaps of differences in the brain networks uh, underlying these uh, disorders and, and therefore in the manifestation of these differences in the underlying networks. Uh, and so the proposition would be to take a, an approach like the RDOC approach um, promulgated by the NIMH, which is this idea of trying to orthogonalize um, these disorders onto axes of neural circuit dysfunction as opposed to symptom clusters. And by doing so, this may provide a more rational, testable basis for therapeutic intervention. So if we think more, a little more about uh, network disorders and, uh, and networks in general, uh, these are just a couple examples of uh, resting state fMRI studies done over the years, um, which just promote the idea that the, the brain is not just one homogeneous blob uh, of, of, of activity, but rather that there are areas that specialize and segregate uh, and that coactivate and work together when they're doing certain things. Uh, and this could be at rest, this could be during activity, but the idea is that there are regions of the brain that work together to accomplish certain behaviors and um, work together to, for example, uh, regulate certain emotions. Um, there's some nice work that's been uh, done by a number of different groups. This is an example of uh, the Stanford group that uh, is talking about psychiatry using this network-based approach. Um, this study is one of a uh, proposition for a neural circuit taxonomy. Uh, so it's known through uh, resting state fMRI studies that there are different uh, networks in the brain. Uh, for example, in blue is the default mode network. These are regions of the brain that tend to be uh, more active when a patient is, for example, just at rest uh, and not engaged in any particular activity. Uh, others, for example, that are um, engaged, like the salience network, when there is a, a salient stimulus or when attention needs to be uh, applied to a certain uh, stimulus. Or in the purple, for example, the positive affect network, these are areas of the brain that seem to engage when um, there's rewarding stimulus or where there's a, a evaluation of reward. So it could be that <clears throat> these types of different networks underlie a different regulation of, of affect, mood, and cognition uh, 
and perhaps dysfunction within these networks um, can differentially manifest in different subtypes of depression. And indeed, there's a you know potential. Uh, there's a proposition within this paper, for example, where biotype one, as shown there, the, the ruminative type of depression is perhaps um, housed in or contained within the default mode network, is in those parts of the brain <clears throat> in the default mode, um, maybe uh, especially responsible for that type of depression, the rumination type. Or, for example, um, the, the, the positive affect circuit, um, you know, dysregulation of that circuit could lead to anhedonic types of depression, as, as exemplified there in this biotype 5. So, again, it could be that uh, dysfunction within these different networks manifests as different types of depression, and importantly, therefore, patients who have these different types of depression have differential contribution from these different networks and different brain regions. So then the question that we're trying to address here is how do we apply this approach of this network-based understanding of mood and, and, and cognitive regulation to, um, to depression and DBS for depression? So to do this, <clears throat> we borrowed from another field um, that thinks about network-based circuits quite a lot, uh, and that is the field of epilepsy. So um, patients with epilepsy who are medically refractory are potentially surgical candidates. If we can identify where the seizures are coming from, we may be able to take out or somehow modulate that area to stop their seizures. Um, very commonly, if we can't figure out where the seizures are coming from based on non-invasive studies, imaging, for example, or, EE, or scalp EEG, um, then oftentimes we will need to actually implant intracranial electrodes. These are uh, probes that go within the brain. This is an example uh, of what uh, an intracranial investigation may look like. So these uh, these probes are placed uh, in the operating room, uh, for example, uh, as shown here. Uh, and then once they're placed in the operating room, the patient then stays in the hospital in the epilepsy monitoring unit for several days while we allow them to have seizures. And when they have the seizures, now with the probes directly in the brain, we can tell exactly where these seizures are starting and then create a surgical plan. So we can apply this approach uh, of intracranial recording to understand uh, neural circuits in the brain, uh, which is used very commonly in epilepsy, but is used um, hardly at all outside of epilepsy. We can apply this to our idea of depression and the network basis of depression. So we can, for example, try to orthogonalize this idea of depression onto these different uh, let's call them symptom domains or dysfunctional domains, uh, the positive affect domain, the negative affect domain, the cognitive control domain. And, and again, these are borrowed from RDOC formalization. Uh, each one of these domains has different symptom clusters associated with it and therefore other um, categories of dysfunctional systems associated with each of these domains. So, for example, <clears throat> the positive affect domain may consist of symptoms of anhedonia, psychomotor retardation, and it may result from dysfunction in reward processing and action initiating systems. And again, these systems can map onto different brain networks uh, based on information, again, that we have from a lot of good uh, imaging and electrophysiology work. We can try to engage these different networks using an interventional procedure like deep brain stimulation. So uh, the table on the left here shows in the, in the far left column different brain regions that we think are involved in the various different symptom domains or constructs shown in those middle columns. So, for example, the ventromedial PFC, the medial OFC, the, the dorsal ACC, et cetera, um, are differentially involved in these different domains and constructs, you know, for example, the positive and negative valence network and the cognitive control network uh, shown by those axes. And then, um, critically, those different uh, gray matter regions can be accessed via different white matter hubs, in particular the VCVS and the subgenual cingulus. So that's shown in the final two columns. We really think of these two areas um, as, as hubs and not necessarily as targets uh, in and of themselves, but rather hubs within networks that we can use to access the rest of the broader network, uh, again, shown in those gray matter areas in the left column. And of course, you'll notice that the BCVS and the subgenual singlet, of course, are the two targets that I mentioned in the beginning in terms of having uh, some interesting data from uh, uh, previous studies. So our approach here really is to um, implant uh, DBS electrodes within those two important target hubs, the BCVS and the subgenual singlet, 
We're using a uh, DBS system that has segmented electrodes, uh, as shown here on the left, uh, and therefore the stimulation field model or the volume of, of uh, tissue that's activated uh, can be um, directionally tuned so that we can kind of push the stimulation direction in in, um, in an arbitrary um, direction around the uh, the axis of that electrode. And then sort of on the right here are um, you know is a, a diffusion tensor imaging analysis of a single patient with an electrode in one spot, but we can engage different subnetworks because we can uh, use the directionality of the system to push the stimulation in one direction versus the other, and therefore with an implanted electrode, without moving it, we can engage different regions of the network uh, just using this directional capability. So our final um, plan here, uh, our, our approach really is, is shown here, which is where we implant a patient with DBS leads, that's shown in red, um, and that's targeting both of these uh, white matter hub targets, the subgenual singlet and the VCVS, um, again shown in red. Uh, and that's uh, two electrodes per hemisphere for a total of four uh, stimulating DBS leads. And also with these temporary um, stereo EEG monitoring electrodes as shown in blue. This is the um, application borrowed from the epilepsy experience uh, where we do this all the time, as I mentioned before. So the patient is implanted with these temporary um, SCG monitoring electrodes targeting these usual suspect regions of, uh, of gray matter, the DLPFC, VMPFC, ACC, OFC, medial temporal region, et cetera. Um, so the patients are, are implanted with this full system, uh, and then we study the system. Um, and just a note in terms of how we actually uh, plan this implant, um, there's a video that's about to play here, which will show you the system that we're using, uh, which is in collaboration with um, another collaborator, Cameron McIntyre, who's a Case Western. Um, who has developed the system using um, a um, augmented reality system for visualizing all of the tracks uh, that are connecting the stimulating electrodes to the temporary monitoring electrodes. Because you can imagine it's a very complicated surgical plan to think in three dimensions regarding all the different electrodes that are being placed and the connections between them. And so this video will show, you know, just an example of how we do the planning using this uh, 3D holographic um, augmented reality system. It's a play video here. It's also oh, look at that. processing massive amounts of data. Okay, so it's 1.30, guys. Like, I know that you guys are just going to be supposed to. I mean, because if, if so we're you going to do this. Base. You, don't want, you don't want up here. You want to be here. Yeah, yeah I think so. Here. Yeah. So like that. Okay. So we're going way, yeah. way down. Okay, so then just continuing on with the the approach for the uh, for these patients. So this shows the full five year timeline of the project, and um, in year two is where we start implanting the patients, and each one of those patients is shown by that little uh, purple plus green bar. Uh, and the little blow up shows the expansion of that purple region. So the patient is implanted. Um, kind of, you know, day zero uh, after their workup. Uh, and I should mention, of course, these are patients with severe and treatment-resistant depression that have failed um, the, uh, the standard uh, medication therapy, behavioral therapy, and electroconvulsive therapy uh, at a minimum, and been evaluated thoroughly by uh, our psychiatry group. So these patients, after the appropriate preoperative procedures and counseling and consent, are enrolled in the study. They're implanted on day zero with the uh, electrode configuration I showed you a couple of slides ago with the uh, per hemisphere, two stimulating electrodes and five uh, uh, SEG monitoring electrodes. They're, they're, they're then kept in the hospital in the EMU for a period of 10 days where we do a series of uh, recording and stimulation experiments to understand their very depression network on an individual basis. So the idea is that by the end of those 10 days, we have a very thorough understanding of their networks as they relate to uh, modulation of uh, affect and emotion and cognition. At the end of the 10 days, the temporary electrodes are um, explanted. The DBS uh, stimulating electrodes are internalized permanently to <clears throat> excuse me, pulse generators. And then they go on and have a year and a half trial uh, with an open label optimization phase followed by a blinded discontinuation phase that is sham controlled. Uh, to get at uh, questions of um, efficacy.
so that's the design of the study. Uh, and overall, the, the idea is that we're trying to figure out this complex problem, which is that in general, in DBS, we have these input parameters, which we adjust, which are shown here, frequency, pulse width, et cetera. And then we have some behavior, which in the case of depression is, you know, mood and other things that the patient reports and can be measured, but maybe crudely. But we don't know the complex transformation that occurs between these input parameters and this output behavior. We're trying to essentially understand this intermediate step of this network state, which consists of the electrographic response of the brain network and circuits to our stimulation. And by understanding this individual, uh, individualized and intermediate, the network state, we can better understand the circuits and therefore better understand how the stimulation is, uh, is actually engaging these circuits and influencing behavior. Uh, and hopefully with this approach, we'll really be able to individually tailor stimulation to each patient and um, move the needle on DBS for depression. So uh, I really like to thank the NIH for the funding um, and thank my uh, collaborators, the co-PIs and uh, co-investigators on the study. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Samir, for the uh, introduction to this talk. Uh, I'm Nader Paradian. I am a professor and vice chair of academic affairs at UCLA in the Department of Neurosurgery. I'm going to continue this talk uh, reviewing uh, our concept of network targeting uh, and engagement as it pertains to developing a therapy of deep brain stimulation for treatment-resistant depression. I'll start with my disclosures. Uh, I work with multiple companies uh, in the neurotechnology space, including um, most relevant Boston Scientific, who is a collaborator uh, on this project. And um, as uh, you've heard, uh, our work is collaborative between uh, Samir Sheff, myself, and Wayne Goodman, who you'll hear from after me, um, on uh, this NIH-funded grant through the Brain Initiative. This is our overall uh, team, and I think it's important to highlight that it is a multidisciplinary team um, across multiple institutions uh, with different uh, areas of expertise. Uh, yeah. You've heard from Samir who has extensive uh, knowledge and familiarity with uh, the neurosurgical applications of uh, psychiatric uh, neuromodulation. And of course, uh, Wayne, who you'll hear from, has extensive uh, experience on the psychiatric side and the management and uh, stimulation and programming of uh, these devices. Uh, and I joined the team uh, with uh, a specific focus um, on the neurosurgical aspects, but also imaging and uh, target engagement. This really is a, a tour de force with uh, input from neurosurgery, psychiatry, imaging, and neuroscience, um, extensive engineering, um, and multiple other teams, uh, as you'll see throughout uh, this presentation and the subsequent presentation. So I think it's important to uh, build off of what we've heard uh, from Samir, but we've had multiple failures of neuromodulation trials um, and we can hypothesize about why those failures have occurred. There can be heterogeneous populations, and so we need methods uh, to improve patient selection. Uh, it could be because of impre imprecise targeting. We don't quite know where to put our uh, electrodes and where to turn on the stimulation. Location is everything in uh, targeted neuromodulation, so we need methods to improve our targeting. Um, and finally, we don't really know too much about stimulation paradigms. We need to better understand the physiology of what we do, uh, of the disease, and the therapeutic interventions. And so what I want to focus on in this part of the talk is really our hypothesis that many of the failures in neuromodulation, particularly for psychiatric applications, is due to inefficient network engagement. So to build on that, I, I want to talk about why we focus on connectivity. Um, and there's multiple lines of evidence that lead us to focus on how the brain is connected. One is uh, in an era of the human connectome, we know that disease, uh, diseases affect networks. We know that depression in particular involves multiple nodes uh, throughout the brain and uh, aberrant communication between those areas of the brain. We also know that there are very rich connections in the brain, particularly in the frontal lobe, uh, which is relevant to uh, treatment-resistant depression. And so if we're going to understand the disease and its networks and these rich connections, we need to uh, figure out how that applies to both our disease and our therapy. The next 
thing is that we know that DBS or uh, deep brain stimulation modulates networks. Uh, you know, for a long time, the field was focused on what deep brain stimulation does at the target nucleus. Um, but now we know that uh, stimulating deep inside the brain actually has widespread effects throughout the brain. And so we need to understand these networks and how to engage the right network uh, with the right stimulation paradigm. Finally, uh, this emphasizing the point, the point of networks, we know that the invasive type of stimulation that we do um, is very much related in terms of functional brain networks to non-invasive stimulation, such as transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, so multiple lines of evidence point to the importance of networks, both for a disease pathophysiology, but also our therapeutic mechanisms. And so when we bring those together, we uh, arrive at this idea that we need to focus on network engagement uh, in our uh, therapy development. I want to take that uh, one step further uh, because we're not just interested in different parts of the brain um, and how they're connected, but how they are functionally connected. And I want to draw an analogy to an area that's very well understood and very well accepted, which is cardiac disease. You know, if you have an abnormality in your heart, you get a cardiac arrhythmia, and we place a cardiac pacemaker, and no one questions their cardiologist if they're told that they need a cardiac pacemaker. And so we would posit that the brain is very similar in that in, if there's a disease in a brain network, that actually causes a brain arrhythmia. And if we're able to put the pacemaker in the right spot in the brain, we can engage those networks and restore a more normal rhythm. And so that's the approach that we take and the philosophy that we have in uh, progressing along this idea of engaging brain networks. One final comment before I get into uh, a few examples is that connectivity can be defined in many different ways. Uh, and uh, before we get into surgery, before we plan our surgery, uh, we can do that with non-invasive methods, particularly diffusion tractography. Uh, but there's also functional methods, uh, which includes uh, deep brain uh, recordings of local field potentials or even spiking activity. Um, and so what we want to do is understand the relationship between all of these different types of connectivity, both in disease and in therapy, and ultimately deliver a very informed and rationalized approach to deep brain stimulation rather than just putting an electrode somewhere and hoping that it's going to work. I want to focus on imaging uh, first, and then I'll move on to neurophysiology. Uh, you know, our field of stereotactic neurosurgery um, has really been a field that's been enabled by uh, technology, precision, but more importantly, brain imaging and mapping. Uh, if we go way back, we were a field that used indirect targeting, uh, pneumoencephalography, just looking at uh, patterns of air in the brain. Then we had a real advance when we had an MRI to see the structure so we can target nuclei, so, such as the subthalamic nucleus, and much work has been put into optimizing those sequences. But I think we're moving into the next area, which is network-based targeting rather than structural targeting. And so our uh, work uh, builds on therapies that we know we, that are effective. Um, and so I'm going to focus uh, briefly on uh, targeted uh, neuromodulation in the thalamus for tremor. Um, it's a really good model, not because particularly we need to improve our therapies for tremor, but if we understand how it applies to um, how network-based targeting can apply to a therapy that we know works, then we can extend it to new diseases. So in this case, um, this is using a focus ultrasound thalamotomy. We could see uh, in the middle panel labeled D, a bright yellow spot, which is the area that has the highest pattern or highest probability of connectivity with precentral gyrus. And um, on the left side of the figure, you can see uh, the focus uh, ultrasound thalamotomy or the area of the brain that's been burned uh, for tremor. And as you uh, slowly shift to the right, you can see the overlap between those two. And what I could show you here are uh, ROC curves. And in particular, what we see is that when there is a high concordance between that area of the thalamus with the highest connectivity of the precentral gyrus, and the lesion that is created by focused ultrasound thalamotomy, uh, we get a very good response or a high probability of a good tremor control. So this shows in practice the uh, theoretical benefits of targeted neuromodulation based on networks. So I'm gonna shift over to the uh, psych psychiatric side and uh, treatment resistant depression. Uh, the area of the subgenual cingulate is the first area I'll focus on. And it's been an area that um, has been of interest since uh, suggested by Helen Mayberg uh, 
uh, several years ago uh, as an essential node in controlling uh, or modulating uh, depression. But we didn't know very much about it, and there's some initial anatomic studies that showed that uh, responders and non-responders seem to be generally targeted in the same area. So structure seemed not to be enough. And there was a suggestion that we could uh, rely on tractography or the connectivity of that area. Uh, and uh, again, by Helen Mayberg and Patricia Rivapasse, uh, developed uh, early evidence that if you were, if the electrode was in a spot that seemed to have connectivity to multiple areas, uh, as the, illustrated in the top right image, uh, then you get a good response. But this can be very challenging to uh, use in real time. You know, it's a um, search and uh, confirm method rather than giving an actual target. And so um, our group worked to develop patient-specific tractography and what we call a tractography-optimized target, meaning that we start with a general area of the subgenuous cingulate, that entire area where everyone seems to get electrodes, and look at the connectivity pattern that emerges from there in each specific patient. And in particular, we're interested in projections that go to the anterior cingulate region, the medial prefrontal cortex, the ventral striatum, through the unctuous fasciculus. And through a series of uh, recursive probability analyses, we could find the one spot, which we call the tractography optimized target, that has the highest probability of connectivity with all of the regions that the subgenual cingulate projects to. And in fact, if we look on the right side of the image uh, with the red, uh, yellow heat map, um, if we look at the tractography across uh, a large cohort of patients from that single voxel that is the tractography optimized target, you can see that we get projections to all of those key areas. Uh, again, the anterior cingulate, the medial prefrontal cortex, ventral striatum, and down through the unctuous fasciculus towards the amygdala. Um, and so we believe that if we use this methodology and we place our electrodes at that area, that tractography optimized target, which is very definable in a tomographic space, then we can get better outcomes for our patients. And so we looked at this um, in a, just a case series of uh, two subjects. We defined this tractography optimized target, which is re-illustrated here in all the different regions. Um, uh, on the top right image, you can see a, a differential pattern of highest probability of connectivity with different areas of the brain. Um, on the bottom left pattern, uh, sorry, the bottom left panel, uh, we see in yellow the single voxel of the highest probability of connectivity uh, with all of those targets. And the bottom right is uh, probably the most important figure. And what it shows in red for both subjects, so there's a subject on top and a subject on bottom, is the pattern of connectivity of that tractography optimized target. And it shows connectivity to all those areas of interest. Um, on the other hand, um, if we look in blue, that is the connectivity of the area that was stimulated in that subject. And you can see that the area that was stimulated in the top panel uh, does not have projections down into the ventral striatum or through the unctuous fasciculus, um, whereas the person who did respond uh, did have that pattern of connectivity. And if we look at how close the area of stimulation was to that tractography optimized target, in fact, the responder was much closer to that target than the non-responder. So we have some real uh, human uh, confirmation that this tractography optimized target is important. And in fact, it's what we are using uh, in our trial as we develop uh, this therapy for depression even further. Just to show you why this is important to look at on an individual basis, um, here are some data from uh, 100 patients, not 100 patients, 100 subjects from the Human Connectome Project. And we looked at the differential probability of connectivity to different areas. So I'll just take you through the top row, but you can look through this uh, at your leisure uh, at the second and subsequent rows. Um, the top row focuses on connectivity to the uncinate fasciculus, but we also have ventral striatum below that anterior cingulate cortex, medial prefrontal cortex on the right and then the left. But on the top row, what we see is um, an area in the um, subgenual cingulate uh, that in most patients has a high probability of connectivity with the uncinate fasciculus. And it tends to be on that first column in the pan, on the sagittal view, posterior uh, within the subgenual cingulate region. Um, on the axial images, it seems to be more uh, lateral. Uh, and, uh, but more importantly than that area of subgenual cingulate that is most commonly connected, you see that there's variability across subjects. So it's not that every single patient has a very 
constant uh, pattern of connectivity within the subject of the cingulate. There is an overall pattern, but there's a lot of intersubject variability, and that's why having these patient-specific tractography-optimized targets we feel is going to be essential. On the right panel, we see that integrated map of where the tractography-optimized target is. And again, I want to emphasize that while there are areas that seem to be hotter, particularly you can see in that axial uh, image where it's lighter green, and uh, but there's a distribution as well. So it's not constant across every single subject. And that lack of consistency is really what we think contributes to that heterogeneity in clinical trials and the failure of some clinical trials. So that's the uh, subgenual thing. We've also done this in the um, ventral capsule, ventral striatum target. Um, and this is something uh, of a work more in progress. Uh, but we used a very similar approach, and we looked at the overall area, the different areas that people have targeted in the ventral capsule, ventral striatum, primarily for obsessive compulsive disorder, but looked at where it connects to. And there are connections to the nucleus accumbens, to the amygdala, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the lateral orbital frontal cortex, and the medial orbital frontal cortex. And we, again, do this recursive process of looking at uh, what which voxels within the general area of interest has the highest probability of connectivity to each of these regions. And then we can create uh, what we call the VCVS TOT, uh, T-O-T it should be, um, which is the tractography optimized target that has the highest probability of connectivity with all the different regions uh, that this area projects to. And uh, in this particular subject, if we look at in that second row, you see it in light blue. In yellow, what you see are stimulation field maps from a patient who was implanted with uh, DBS for OCD. And really what I want to highlight is the overlap between our tractography optimized target and that stimulation field map showing very good concordance in this person who happens to be a good responder to the therapy. We see the same pattern in this uh, next uh, subject or example subject where the tractography optimized target is shown in light blue in the first and second row. Yellow in the third row shows our stimulation field map. And if we look at the bottom row, the green areas show a high area of concordance uh, between this tractography optimized target and our stimulation field map in, in patients who experience benefit from deep brain stimulation. So again, we have a tractography or network guided area that we can target for potential therapy. The last thing I wanted to highlight in terms of tractography is that, in fact, it helps us identify differences between our targets. And uh, what we see here uh, are the projections from the subgenual cingulate, which is shown in red, as well as the ventral capsule, ventral striatum, both of which we know project to prefrontal cortices. But when we look at the two together, we can very clearly see different patterns of connectivity of the prefrontal cortex. In this example, you see the uh, prefrontal projections of the ventral capsule, ventral striatum, really wrapping around the projections of the subgenual cingulate. And this is important for the next part of our study that I'm about to tell you about, because it tells us where we need to record from. When we're interested in these networks um, in developing our therapy, it gives us patient-specific targets uh, to put our recording electrodes in in order to really understand the networks related to disease as well as our therapies. So I want to transition briefly to the neurophysiological side of network engagement um, and show you an example, again, from our uh, work in the thalamus. Uh, but in, during deep brain stimulation surgeries, we're putting electrodes deep in the thalamus. Um, but we're also putting an ECOG strip, as shown in, on the top left panel labeled B, an ECOG strip over the cortex. And what we're looking for on the bottom left is the tracks that connect the thalamic target with the cortical target. And in fact, we are able to identify the cortical region of recording that's connected to our uh, thalamic area. And on the top right, although it's small, um, what you'll see is that there's very specific patterns of coherence or coupling of oscillatory activity between the thalamus and cortex, and it's very spatially specific. Um, and we can show that there's not only coherence or coupling, but there's what we call thalamocortical phase amplitude coupling between the thalamus and cortex that, again, is very spatially specific, and it's modulated by activity. So this is important because it shows us that these structural connections are not just structural connections, but we can actually use it to target our functional recordings. And so it takes us to the final step, 
um, which is uh, this slide that illustrates the clinical trial uh, that we're about to undertake, in which we are going to target our deep brain stimulation electrodes based on our tractography, uh, based on those tractography optimized targets, but we're also going to put recording electrodes in the areas that we believe those those uh, deep brain submission targets are projecting to. So within the medial prefrontal cortex, within the orbital frontal cortex, in the amygdala, uh, as well as the anterior cingulate region. And so we are now making a complete loop between uh, image-guided uh, network engagement as well as physiological network monitoring. Um, and we will have these patients in the hospital uh, for 10 days recording from their brains while they perform a specific uh, behavioral tasks while we activate the electrodes to actually confirm uh, neuromodulation of these distant, distant regions within the network and eventually put all these together, synthesize these to develop patient-specific uh, patterns of stimulation to uh, treat the underlying diagnosis of treatment-resistant depression. So in conclusion, uh, I think the era of just try it and invasive neuromodulation is really behind us. We need to have a much more informed approach, and uh, we would posit that it's this network-guided modulation uh, that is critical, and we can look at the networks both with imaging as well as with neurophysiology. Uh, I think we can and should be targeting, engaging, and recording from disease and symptom-related networks. Uh, and the idea that I think is really important is that these concepts of network engagement, really we, we can learn from one disease and apply it to other diseases. As I've shown here, both in imaging and neurophysiology, that we have extended what we've learned in the thalamocortical relationships to uh, networks that are specific to treatment-related uh, depression or treatment-resistant treatment depression. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and acknowledge um, Evie Tsolaki, who's done uh, the vast majority of the imaging work here uh, that I've shared, as well as uh, Sarush uh, Niketarad, who uh, is listed right below her, um, who did uh, much of the thalamic work that you've seen here. Um, and then we've got an extensive uh, team of collaborators across multiple sites, and of course the NIH and Brain Initiative for supporting um, our uh, project. And so now you'll be hearing from Wayne Goodman, uh, another uh, key member of our leadership team, on the challenges and next steps in terms of programming these devices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Paradian. I'm Wayne Goodman. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist uh, uh, and uh, I'm a professor and chair of psychiatry at the Menger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Baylor College of Medicine. And it's my pleasure to uh, tell you a little bit more about our study funded by NIH Brain of deep brain stimulation for depression using uh, directional current steering and individualized network targeting. Uh, here are my disclosures. I'll just give you a chance to look at that. Uh, along with uh, Dr. Sheth and Paradian, uh, I'm one of the uh, PIs on this uh, project. As uh, described earlier, uh, this is a complex multidisciplinary team. So I'm part of that multidisciplinary team that includes neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, neurologists, psychologists, and uh, engineers uh, from both Baylor, UCLA, Brown University, University of Pittsburgh, University of Chicago, and uh, uh, Boston Scientific is, is uh, providing uh, the uh, DBS devices that we'll be using in this study in patients with treatment-resistant depression. As you've already heard, uh, we're going to be, uh, not we, but the neurosurgeons will be implanting DBS electrodes in two brain areas bilaterally, the ventral, capsule ventral striatum, as well as the subgenual cingulate uh, cortex. And um, as well, one of the inno very innovative aspects of this project is also patients will be spending approximately 10 days in the EMU, the epilepsy monitoring unit, in which they will also have additional SEEG electrodes placed in nodes within uh, the uh, what, what has become referred to as the depression network. And this will give us an opportunity to learn more about uh, that network that forms depression at the individual level and also be an opportunity 
uh, to test out uh, various DBS parameters for these two different brain regions. Uh, and then, uh, although I'll be involved in the EMU part, my major role is post-operative uh, when I uh, conduct the programming of the uh, DBS devices. And what we're hoping is during these sessions in the EMU uh, that we will be uh, learning about that patient's network and an algorithm will actually be developed uh, that will uh, help uh, dictate the programming parameters so that it won't take uh, months for me to be able to optimize the programming for that patient. Uh, one, one of the uh, uh, aspects of this study that I, I wanted to spend most of this time telling you about is how we're going to be uh, measuring emotional state. Uh, in another NIH brain-funded initiative, uh, I'm working to develop uh, adaptive deep brain stimulation for obsessive-compulsive disorder. And in that study, we, we were faced with a, a challenge because uh, we were also recording from the brain is how do we measure changes in mood, affect, anxiety? Uh, normally, uh, in, in patients with psychiatric disorders, the gold standard for assessing these different dimensions of emotional state are to administer a clinician-rated instrument that's been standardized. Uh, but when we're looking at changes in brain activity over a very short span of time, and we're trying to in interpret uh, those signals, uh, decode what's happening in the brain. Um, it, it, the time frame is not on the same time scale as the brain activity. So uh, what we've identified for that study that I just mentioned, as well as this study that we're talking about now, is the use of computer vision machine learning in order to uh, assess what the emotional state of the individual based upon their facial affect. And uh, I, I like to say that, uh, that measuring uh, tremor in studies which are similar to this, looking at developing new technologies of DBS for tremor, whether it's in Parkinson's disease or essential tremor, uh, it's a little bit easier in, in that we have an, a more objective measure than we do with psychiatric state. But the closest we have to the motor out, output, the motor output of emotional state is affect. And so that's what we, we, we decide to um, uh, try to capitalize on. Uh, I, so I found uh, a collaborator, uh, Jeff Cohn, who's a psychologist at the University of Pittsburgh, who had developed, along with engineers at Carnegie Mellon University, a system that's referred to as automated facial affect recognition or AFAR for short. And this, this platform will be time-locked in the uh, epilepsy monitoring unit uh, with inputs, uh, rec recordings from the uh, LFPs, the SEEG uh, electrodes, as well as uh, physio physiology and changes in uh, programming that we conduct or, uh, or also uh, in response to tasks that we conduct in the EMU. And this uh, AFAR system automatically identifies and scores action units that is, uh, movements of the underlying facial muscles associated with different uh, uh, affects. And the, uh, here, here's a, a, a little further description of the AFAR system. It's based upon approximately 40 action units that have been identified over time that map onto discrete emotions corresponding to uh, movements of underlying uh, facial muscles uh, that produce these facial expressions. In the past, uh, one would have to use uh, EMG recordings in order to assess changes in muscle contractions. And then there was a period of time in which a video uh, replaced the EMG, but it, it required that often graduate students or postdocs would have to go frame by frame uh, in order to rate uh, the, the changes in uh, emotional expression. But this AFAR system uh, developed by University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon uh, uh, uses machine learning, computer vision, which, which enables uh, those measurements to occur in real time in an automated fashion and, uh, and in a fashion that's quantitative.
In the next video, uh, one of the uh, engineers who developed this system, Laszlo Jenny, will be demonstrating an important feature of the AFR system in which the uh, AFR system tracks facial features. You'll see that it automatically identifies eyes, eyebrows, nose, and mouth. And then uh, if you look closely, you will see that there's a blue mesh superimposed over the surface of the face. And they're at uh, each point of contact, which I, I think is in the neighborhood of 1,000 points, the system on the back end is measuring the displacement or, or a movement uh, underlying his changes in facial expression. Please show the next video. So that video has demonstrated the ability of the system to track facial features and also to track the movement of underlying muscle groups, uh, even though the subject himself is moving. In the next video, I'm going to show you the FR system in action, and individuals being interviewed, and what you'll see is plotted along the screen uh, are different action units. For example, action unit 12, which is associated with uh, the muscles that pull up the corners of the mouth, which is one of the features associated with smiling. And you'll see uh, as she's speaking, the uh, action units corresponding to those different uh, aspects of, of facial affect or action units uh, will be uh, registering uh, to the right. Please show the next video. What I will be showing you in the next video is a video clip of a patient uh, in the operating room. This is a patient with uh, treatment-resistant obsessive compulsive disorder, but the target that's being stimulated is the same as one of the brain regions that will be implanted in our study of treatment-resistant depression, namely the ventral capsule, ventral striatum. And this particular uh, patient's case uh, the stimulation started um, on, on, in one hemisphere, and it'll be, it'll be obvious to you uh, when the stimulation starts. She has what uh, we have described in the literature as a mirth response. And I think it will be also apparent to you about when the stimulation is turned off, as you will see her positive affect begin to fade. And by the end, she will be back to baseline. And what we've done, we've taken a, a video that was originally recorded in the operating room and then used the AFR system to, uh, on top of it, to demonstrate how it can uh, automatically uh, and quantitatively uh, measure changes in, uh, in this case, the uh, demonstration of a positive valence affect. Please show the next video. Next condition is now. <laughs>
Describe what you're feeling right now. I feel happy. Feel happy. Can you describe that? I feel happy like like <laughs> like someone just called me and told me that I won a cruise to 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 um to to a nice place. A nice place. How do you feel right now? Not so happy. So let me uh, summarize uh, my segment of this presentation on uh, the study of uh, deep brain stimulation using uh, steerable currents and treatment-resistant depression. Uh, that one of the challenges we, we're facing in uh, a psychiatric disorder is to have a, a way of measuring changes in mood or other constructs associated with depression or other domains of depression in a way that's objective uh, and a way that can be done in a fashion that we can time lock it uh, with the changes in DBS programming and our uh, recordings directly from the brain. So what, what I've demonstrated to you is the use of a form of computer vision machine learning, which we refer to as automated facial affect recognition, that will be uh, employing in the epilepsy monitoring unit as one of the outcomes. We'll also be using uh, more conventional clinical measures as well as self-ratings of the patient state. Uh, and uh, uh, the, those different modalities will be combined in order for us to have a complete picture of the individual state, both during the EMU experience and certainly afterwards uh, as we uh, attempt to improve their symptoms uh, by uh, programming uh, their uh, devices. And a steerable uh, current DBS uh, leads allow more precise stimulation to target areas mediating therapeutic effects, as well as avoiding areas associated with adverse effects. Uh, but the segmented leads also increase the complexity of programming. And particularly in our study, implanting four leads targeting two different brain areas, the ventral striatum and subgenual cingular cortex bilaterally, will add further complexity. But combining computer vision machine learning with network analysis during this extended stay in the EMU may enable development of an algorithm for programming in the post-operative state. Now, other devices uh, uh, that are also being developed offer unique opportunity to record in real time from the brain during naturalistic uh, behavior. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the very large team in, involved in this project uh, from uh, 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 Baylor uh, and other institutions. Thank you very much.